1914, two German physicists carried out a fascinating experiment, a miniature particle collider, in which they accelerated electrons to bombard mercury atoms. Their goal was to probe the atomic structure. What they found was quantum energy levels. During his successful experiments testing Maxwell's equations, the German physicist Heinrich Hertz discovered electromagnetic waves and the photoelectric effect. His work led to Philip Leonard's experiments and Einstein's hypothesis of light quanta. In 1914, Hertz's nephew, Gustav Hertz, together with James Frank, both physicists working in Berlin, set up an experiment to investigate the internal structure of atoms by smashing electrons onto them. The idea was that by measuring the electrons after they collided with the atoms in the gas, they could infer properties of the target atoms. This follows the spirit of the geiger marsden experiment, whose results led Rutherford to infer the nuclear structure of the atom by studying the trajectories of alpha particles used to bombard materials. Almost a decade later, Arthur Holly Compton used a similar approach, radiating materials with X-rays. Carefully studying the scattered radiation, he finally confirmed the particle nature of light proposed by Einstein almost 20 years earlier. Interestingly, the same concept, at a much larger scale, was used half a century later, where electrons were accelerated at the over 3 km Stanford Linear Accelerator in the US to bombard targets, revealing the quark structure of the proton. Back in Berlin, instead of kilometers, the Frank Hertz experiment used an acceleration of only a few millimeters. Inside a glass tube like this, electrons are emitted by a hot filament close to a controlled metal grid that lets the electrons go through. On the other side, a second positive metal grid attracts and accelerates the electrons. The holes in the grid let the fast-moving electrons pass through. Given the potential difference V used to accelerate the electrons, we can calculate how fast they will be moving when reaching the accelerating grid using conservation of energy. The potential energy given by the charge of the electron times the voltage, will become kinetic energy one half mv squared, from where we can solve for the speed and find this relation. Frank and Hertz use a variable voltage to analyze the behavior of these electrons over a range roughly between 1 and 15 volts. Plugging the minimum value, we get that the electrons will move very fast. The next step was to introduce a target for these electrons to collide with. The tube contains a drop of liquid mercury. Placing this tube in an oven at 150 degrees Celsius, mercury will evaporate from the liquid drop, filling the tube and the path of the electrons with a vapor of mercury atoms. These atoms are of course moving due to their thermal energy. We can use conservation of energy to estimate how fast they move. The thermal energy can be written as 3 halves kT, where K is Boltzmann's constant and T is the temperature in Kelvin. Setting this equal to their kinetic energy, we found that the average thermal speed of the mercury atoms is given by this expression, where uppercase M is the mass of a single mercury atom. To find the mass of a mercury atom, we use that its molar mass is 200.59 grams per mole. Dividing by Avogadro's number, we get the mass in grams. Converting this mass to kilograms and using the temperature in Kelvin, we find that the average thermal speed of the mercury atoms is a slightly over 200 meters per second. Here we notice that the electrons in the Frank Hertz tube move thousands of times faster. Therefore, from the point of view of these electrons, the mercury atoms are practically at rest. Let's now consider the collision between one of these fast electrons and a mercury atom. Conservation of energy and momentum can be used to determine the speed of each particle after the collision. Solving for the atom's momentum uppercase P prime in terms of the electron's momentum P and taking its square, we find this relation, where theta is the angle between the electron's momentum before and after the collision. We can find the term on the left-hand side from the energy conservation relation. Plugging it here, we get a quadratic equation. After some algebra, we find that the speed of the electron after the collision is this. We can simplify this expression by noticing that the mercury atom is almost half a million times more massive 
than the electron, so the ratio of their masses can be neglected. And this expression reduces to simply V prime equals V, where I have ignored the amphysical negative solution. This result means that the electron bounces in some direction, but without changing its speed. This type of collision is called elastic scattering. From the energy condition, we can directly see that the mercury atom remains at rest, which makes sense, because the atom is too massive. This collision can be visualized as a ping pong ball striking a bowling ball. The ping pong ball will bounce with the same speed, and the heavy bowling ball will not move at all. These are the calculations that Frank and Hertz did in late 1913. Bohr's atomic model was less than half a year old and not widely known. Spectral lines were still a mystery for many. Frank and Hertz imagined that if they could excite an atom by hitting it with high-speed electrons, maybe the atom could borrow energy from the electrons and then give off the excess energy in the form of spectral lines. The boring expectation, according to the calculation that we just did, was that electrons will simply elastically scatter of the mercury atoms. But Frank and Hertz hoped to excite the atom so that at some point the electron could undergo an inelastic collision instead, transferring some of its energy to the atom. These inelastic collisions would make the electrons reach the accelerating grid with less energy than expected. Here Frank and Hertz included a way to distinguish these low-energy electrons from the normally expected high-energy electrons. Just like those popular signs in amusement parks that say, you must be this tall to ride, Frank and Hertz added an electrostatic way to reject low-energy electrons. In 1902, Philip Leonard introduced the so-called stopping potential to slow electrons down in the photoelectric effect. The same idea was later used by Robert Millikan to determine the kinetic energy of photoelectrons, which led him to confirm Einstein's predictions and win the Nobel Prize. Frank and Hertz included a stopping potential behind the accelerating grid. In this way, the experiment rejects low-energy electrons. Notice that if the collisions between electrons and mercury atoms are elastic, there will be no energy loss. The electrons will bounce around, but they will arrive at the accelerating grid as if the mercury atoms were not there. Frank and Hertz intended to check if any deviation from these perfect elastic collisions of electrons occur, and from these infer features of Mercury's atomic structure. This is how the experiment works. The accelerating potential can be varied between 1 and 15 volts. On their way to the positive accelerating grid, the electrons will collide with the Mercury atoms and elastically scatter. Then they will go through the accelerating grid after which they encounter a repulsive electric field. As long as the electrons have more energy than the stop it potential, they will continue to the collector electrode. The collector's current is a direct measure of how many electrons reach the collector. Therefore, as the accelerating potential is increased, the current through the collector will also increase. There is a fantastic film by the Physical Science Study Committee, published in 1961, showing all these details. We will measure the tube current as we change the accelerating voltage. And I will read the accelerating voltage on this meter from 0 to 30 volts, and the anode current on the electrometer. If I increase the voltage continuously and smoothly, the current also rises smoothly. Now we can introduce mercury atoms into the path of the electrons by placing the tube in this oven and heating it to about 160 degrees centigrade. Now then, as we increase the accelerating voltage, electrons are being accelerated between the grids more and more. There, something's happening, a drop in current. Something suddenly happened to the electrons so that they couldn't get across to the anode and be counted. But now you also notice that the current was beginning to increase as I stopped increasing accelerating voltage. Let's continue with this and see what happens as I continue to increase accelerating voltage. 12 volts, another drop. Once more, an increase, another drop, a big one. Further increase, smoothly 
increasing accelerating voltage. Another drop, fourth one. A dropping current implies that less electrons are reaching the collector, meaning that those missing electrons lost their energy after colliding with the mercury atoms and could not overcome the repulsion generated by the negative collector because they had less energy than the stop it potential. This is precisely the signature of inelastic collisions that Frank and Hertz were looking for. But something quite unexpected also happened. The drops appear at regular intervals of accelerating potential. In the film, the experiment is repeated, but this time plotting the collector's current as a function of the accelerating potential. Well, now this really looks interesting. I think we'd better go back and do it again. This time, I would like to use an automatic recording device which will plot the anode current as a function of accelerating voltage. As I further increase accelerating voltage, the current begins to rise. There now starts the first dip. Once more, the current begins to rise. Another decrease, a big one this time. And then another increase. The peaks seem to be just about 5 volts apart. Let's see if this continues. And now we're up to the 30 volts, which is the maximum that I want to put between the grids. The experiment shows that the drops occur at regular intervals of 4.9 volts. To compare, this is a plot reported by Frank and Hertz in 1914. When increasing the accelerating voltage from 0 to, say, 4.7 volts, the collisions are elastic, as expected, but something happens around 4.9 volts when the atoms suddenly accept energy from the electrons. Then when the accelerating voltage keeps increasing, the inelastic collisions disappear. The atom simply refuses to accept more energy until 9.8 volts are reached, and again at 14.7 volts. What's going on here? It is as if the mercury atoms only accept energy from the electrons at multiples of a specific energy. Frank and Hertz interpreted the 4.9 electron volts as the energy needed to ionize the mercury atoms and published their results in April of 1914. However, other measurements had shown the ionization energy of mercury to be over 10 electron volts, therefore something was wrong with their interpretation. But they did notice something very important. The energy of an electron accelerated by 4.9 volts is 7.8 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. This is the energy that the mercury atom receives. If this energy is then given off by the atom in the form of radiation, we can estimate its wavelength using Einstein's formula, E equals h nu, or hc divided by lambda. Solving for the wavelength, we get lambda equals hc divided by the energy. Plug in the values, we get a wavelength of 2536 angstroms, which is exactly the wavelength of a well-known intense ultraviolet line in the mercury spectrum. Although they still didn't know the reason, this observation convinced Frank and Hertz that the accelerated electrons transferred their kinetic energy to the mercury atoms, which then radiated the energy away in the form of this spectral line. Remember that they still didn't know about Bohr's atomic model. Since their experiment clearly show that, contrary to what we calculated earlier, energy is being transferred from the electrons to the mercury atoms via inelastic collisions, Frank and Hertz carried out a follow-up experiment. The setup was identical, but they added a spectrograph, so they could observe the spectral lines of the mercury gas. In the words of James Frank, if the conjecture conversion of kinetic energy into light on impact should take place, then on bombardment with 4.9 electron volt electrons, the line 2537 angstrom and only this line out of the complete spectrum of mercury should appear. This image shows many spectral lines of mercury from the Frank Hertz tube under a high voltage discharge. On the left, we see the 2537 spectral line. The image below shows the light observed by Frank and Hertz in their new experiment. And as they conjecture, only the 2537 line appears. The bright light on the right is just the continuous radiation of the glowing filament. So what is really happening in the Frank-Hertz experiment? Bohr's atomic model solves the mystery. 
When the electrons in the tube are accelerated by less than 4.9 volts, they cannot transfer energy to the atom, and they undergo elastic collisions as expected, reaching the collector as if the mercury atoms were not there. When the accelerating voltage is 4.9 volts, the electrons will have 4.9 electron volts of energy when reaching the accelerating grid. Since 4.9 electron volts is exactly the energy difference between the first two atomic levels in mercury, electrons colliding with mercury atoms in the neighborhood of the grid will transfer this energy and will not pass the stopping potential, creating the drop in the collector's current. When the accelerating voltage is between 4.9 and 9.8 volts, the electrons in the tube will transfer 4.9 electron volts to the mercury atoms and continue to the collector with the energy they have left. Any further collision with mercury will be elastic. At 9.8 volts, electrons have enough energy to transfer their energy in two collisions, and the same occurs at higher accelerating voltage. In other words, the periodic drops in current appear because the electrons have enough energy to undergo multiple inelastic collisions with the gas. After the inelastic collisions, the mercury atoms radiate away the exact energy in the form of light of a very precise wavelength. Unfortunately, the 2537 line from mercury falls outside the visible part of the spectrum, and special equipment is needed. Otherwise, the tube would exhibit glowing regions as the voltage increases. But fortunately, the same experiment can be done with a gas of a much lower atomic number. Remember that according to Bohr, the radiation frequency is proportional to z squared. In particular, a widely used version of the Frank Hertz experiment with neon gas instead of mercury allows visually identifying the regions in the tube where inelastic collisions take place, and the electrons transfer their energy to the neon atoms. This is what we see in this image as the glowing regions. There is also a direct commercial application of the Frank Hertz experiment that you have probably seen in any old building or films, fluorescent lights. These are mass-produced Frank Hertz experiments. The tubes are filled with low-pressure mercury vapor and the interior surface of the tube is covered with a phosphorus coating. When the invisible light of the 2537 line from mercury shines over the internal surface, the fluorescent coating glows. Personally, this is one of my favorite experiments in modern physics. I will never forget the day I did this experiment in the lab when I was an undergraduate student. I knew the result, but I remember that seeing the equally spaced current drops was so impressive that it left a lasting impact. James Frank and Gustav Hertz provided the first experimental validation of Bohr's atomic model, and over 10 years later, they were awarded the 1925 Nobel Prize in Physics for their discovery of the laws governing the impact of an electron upon an atom. The 30-minute film mentioned early is highly recommended. The link is in the description below, and you will enjoy it for sure. Remarkably, the film ends with a nice overview by James Frank himself, in which he not only describes the experiment, but amusingly explains why they didn't know about Bohr's paper. An interpretation of the inelastic impact of 4.9 volt electrons with mercury atoms. Indeed, we had a result which was in best agreement with Bohr's uh, theory. The line 2537 is the transition before, between the first excited state and the ground state. It might interest you that when we made the experiments that we did not know Bohr's theory. We have neither read it nor heard about it. We have not read it because we were negligent to read the literature well enough. And uh, you know how that happens. The experiment gave it to us and we were surprised about it. But we are not surprised after we read Bohr's paper later after our publication.